People find real values, objective goods in the world. But our job is now to lead them to the summum bonum that's beyond even these great values they discover. Welcome back to the Word on Fire show. I am Brandon Vaught, the Senior Publishing Director at Word on Fire. What is the meaning of it all? What's the meaning of life? How do we find it? That's what we're going to be discussing today with Bishop Robert Barron, who joins us in studio. Bishop, good to see you. Hey, Brandon. Always good to be with you. We got a new issue of the Evangelization and Culture Journal, which just oh, yeah. came out. This, of course, is our quarterly journal for members of the Word on Fire Institute. If you're not yet a member, now's a good time to sign up. You can get a free copy of this journal. But the new edition is on the topic of freedom. I know you've had a chance to check it out, Bishop. Maybe say a few words about it. Yeah, it's fantastic. You know, chapeau to um, Todd Warner, our great editor, who does a marvelous job in the design team. Uh, it's just a beautiful uh, magazine to hold in your hands and to look at. And it's filled with good stuff. Um, I just finished the interview with uh, Bobby Mixo, who's been with us for a long time. And uh, Robert George himself has a good article there about, um, is he's the, the one, I'm conflating two things, with the Newman and John Stuart Mill. I think that was Robert George's article. Uh, Elizabeth Scalia's got a piece in there. Uh, I've got an interview about um, uh, my book on the Creed. So all kinds of great stuff in that. Pick up your copy at wordonfire.institute. When you sign up, you'll get a copy of that journal, a free book, lots of other stuff, including some great courses inside of our institute. Okay, let us turn to the topic of meaning. I want to get right into this because this is a, a long and loaded topic here. Uh, maybe we could begin with a recent discussion you had with three other gentlemen on Jordan Peterson's podcast. So the group included Jordan Peterson, yourself, Jonathan Paggio, and John Verveke. Uh, the title of this video, which you can find on YouTube, was The Four Horsemen of Meaning. I want to come back to that in a second. The discussion lasted over two hours. It yeah. already has over 500,000 views. Um, maybe first tell us, how did this come about? What are the four horsemen of meaning? What does that allude to? And what were your initial impressions of the discussion? Yeah, I think it came out of the conversation I had with Jordan Peterson now almost a year ago. So he and I did, a, I think, over two-hour conversation. And we hit on some of those same topics. And then Jonathan Peugeot, who's the uh, wonderful... Uh, icon writer and I, I, uh, sculptor of icons, and a, a guy that's very wise in regard to the symbolic tradition. And then Verveke is a fellow, I didn't know him that well, but he's a psychology professor at the University of Toronto and looking into the question of consciousness and how that relates to meaning. So I think it was Peterson's uh, you know camp kind of reached out to me and said, would you be willing to sit down with the three of them and talk about this whole question and how it's... Um, you know, intriguing a lot of younger people today. So I said, yeah, I'd love to. So I think I did, I think I was down at the cathedral in LA and we hooked up the cameras and lights and, and I broadcast from there. And it, as you say, went on for well over two hours. And it's something I kind of like now, uh, you know, I worried about the short attention span of a lot of millennials and youngers, you know, given given the social media. But uh, now it seems like a lot of people are get are very interested in these long form podcasts. Think of, you know, Joe Rogan is on for three hours with people. And Peterson, too, typically goes two hours. And we were talking at a pretty high level, too. It's not like just a real user-friendly uh, mode of discourse. But that's how it came about. And uh, the Four Horsemen thing, of course, goes right back to the Book of Revelation. But that was picked up by the New Atheists, right? The Four Horsemen of Atheism, they call themselves, I guess. The Hitchens, Dawkins, Harris, and Dennett, right? So I think they're now playing on that, that we're... I guess, the four horsemen riding in the other direction, you know, the direction of meaning. At the very beginning of the discussion, Jordan began by asking each one of the other three guests how they would define meaning. And here was your definition. You said, meaning is to be in a purposive relationship to a value. Mm -hmm. And then you added, to, be, to live a religiously meaningful life is to be in purposive relationship to the sunum bonum, or the supreme value, uh, say more about that. What do you mean by that definition of meaning? I was trying to make it as simple as possible. Um, and I was using Dietrich von Hildebrand there, whom I rely on a lot in these matters, that uh, these basic values appear. And they shouldn't be analyzed um, uh, to dust. What I mean is they, they appear. 
they're there in the world. That's to say aesthetic values, beautiful things. When you hear Beethoven's Seventh Symphony, you say, yeah, that's beautiful. Uh, moral values appear. So the, the, the uh, act of Maximilian Kolbe at the end of his life, you know, surrendering himself to save his other man. Yeah, that's just good. That, that's morally good. Intellectual values appear. You read uh, Plato's Symposium and you say, yeah, that's true. He's speaking a great truth there. Well, these things appear, and a good education, our friend C.S. Lewis, I think, would agree with this, is teaching people how to recognize those values. So they, they are intrigued by the right things, that their, their wills and their passions are engaged by the right things. So I'm saying here that um, a meaningful life is in a purposive relationship to a value. You not only appreciate the value, but now you're ordering your life toward it. You're saying, my life is about appreciating uh, uh, that value and maybe even trying to imitate that value so that, that I can try to do something at least akin to what Plato did, something akin to what Maximilian Kolbe did, uh, something akin to Beethoven. Even though I don't have the, the gifts of all these people, I'm in a purposive relationship to the value that I've discerned. I think that's what makes your life meaningful. And then the next step, well, what's the supreme value? So I just named a handful of values, right? They're all sorts of moral values at different levels of importance. We say to a little kid like, no, no, don't, don't take that you know, glass of water away from your sister. Well, you're inculcating, you're, you're awakening them to a moral value. Then there's Maximilian Kolbe, that, you know, a moral value at the highest possible level. Same with aesthetic values. Teach a little kid like, yeah, look at, you can, you know, you can draw a bird by doing this and, and oh yeah, that's, that's beautiful. And then there's, you know, there's Michelangelo. Um, so to be in a purposive relationship to the highest value, the summum bonum, the supreme good, that's now to be in a religiously meaningful life. Um, much of the purpose of education and formation is to move people into this realm of objective value, but not just into it, but to move into it in a hierarchically ordered way, where you lead people to higher and higher expressions of value. And then finally, we talked about Jacob's Ladder last time, what goes to the very highest truth and goodness and beauty? We name that God, right? And a religiously meaningful life is one that is purposefully related to that good. There's lots of talk today about the meaning crisis, that we're suffering yeah. a crisis of meaning, and people point to all sorts of indicators such as record high suicide rates and opioid, addi opioid addictions and depression rates, addictions. Um, do you sense that as well? Do you think we're, we're suffering a, a unique crisis of meaning today? Yeah. And I'd be, I think, in line here with Charles Taylor and other uh, philosophers who would say, look, up until the really, let's say, maybe late 19th, early 20th century, most people in most civilizations in human history would say, you can't really be happy outside of a relationship with a transcendent good. So let's name it as broadly as we can. Some transcendent good. Without a relationship to God, I can't really be happy. I can't really be satisfied. It's only in relatively recent years in the West that people have begun to say, no, I can be happy, satisfied without that relationship. Bottom line is you can't. And that's where a lot of the meaninglessness, depression, anxiety, uh, sense of drift is coming from. The other thing I'd say, Brandon, is if the realm of value is objective, it's outside of us. It impresses itself upon us. So, go back to Beethoven's Seventh Symphony, is it's not because it pleases me. That's such a, a crude, superficial way of talking about it. It, it changes me is better. It, it controls me. It takes possession of me. Maximilian Kolbe's act is not one that I say, oh yeah, that's, you know, I, I, that, that pleases me to see that. Oh, come on. Probably do it doesn't please me, by the way. It frightens me, if anything. But it's massively valuable, and I recognize it as such. If you say, as many people do today, 
that, oh, no, no, value all comes from inside of me as a matter of my own choice, is I generate value. That's never going to make you happy, on the contrary. If you say, oh, yeah, it's, it's whatever, you know, goes along with my private desires, my superficial tastes, well, I'm not going to be happy. I'm happy when the good knocks me down and rearranges me and chooses me and, and calls me and summons me to become an evangelist for it. See, I'm using Baltzar's language here. You know, when you've, you see a great play or a great film or you hear a marvelous symphony or you meet a great saintly person and you say, wow, I, I never thought that was possible. That, that's he or it has, has rearranged my thinking. And now I want the whole world to know about this. I didn't know this was possible. So I invented it. Give me a break. You didn't think it was even possible. But it it grabbed you. It rearranged you and then sent you on mission. See, now we're talking. Now we're talking. All the great heroes of the Bible, by the way, they're not self-inventors. <laughs> you know, uh, boy, I, you know, I, I'm going to generate my own meaning. I mean, the Bible is utterly uninterested in that. They're interested in those people who are knocked to the ground and rearranged and heard. They heard a voice, a higher voice. You know, and don't, don't literalize that as they're hearing a, you know, a physical voice come out of the cloud. It's a symbol for this attunement to the supreme value that is now calling out to me, right? See, now we're talking. Now we're into the realm of real value, and that's going to make us happy. You know, as a father of seven young kids and an eighth on the way, I think I told you that, that uh, we were pregnant with our eighth child. Did uh, you? watch a lot of... Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if you did. <laughs> Surprise to the whole yeah, world. I yeah, I don't know. We are. There's so many kids that were coming born on fire, <laughs> I lose track. Well, congratulations. I don't think I knew no, that, thank Brandon. You. No, thank you. We were just joking on that note the other day oh, about goodness. how... <laughs> you know, Word on Fire's got um, almost 60 employees, and I think we have six or seven Word on Fire babies <laughs> yeah. gestating. I I'm not sure that there's ever going to be a year where we don't have a Word on Fire baby in the next I know. several decades, God willing. You know, I was anyway, going to say, I that would have been a perfect moment for a spit take, you know, in the old vaudeville, because <laughs> like, I was drinking, and the eight's on the way, pff, you know, I should have <laughs> well, done that. Uh, where ahead, I was I'm going sorry. with that was, yeah, as a father yeah. of all these kids, you know, we watch a ton of kids' movies. And I must yeah. say, one of the things that really bugs me, you can ask my wife, Kathleen, is how so many of, of these movies follow the same pattern of meaning crisis, but then look within to discover yeah. true meaning. And it's not, it's not even self-invention the way you're describing. These yeah. characters recognize meaning is something I discover, not something I create. But the place to discover it is within. Follow your feelings. Listen to right. your heart. Look in. Discover who you are. Find yourself. And I think, like, like with you, it, it leads to a dead end. It's the exact opposite direction you should be going. That meaning, as you're saying, is found outward, either among us or beyond us. There's, there's some objective values we need to latch on to and align our lives to to find objective meaning. Right. I mean, look at... We're such unreliable guides. You know, I, I'm such a sinner, and I'm, I'm so mixed up about so many things and so lost that I'm going to look inside me and my my mind and my little desires to find meaning. I mean, give me a break. I, I, I'd be a wreck. When Paul says, you're right, fides ex auditu, faith comes from hearing. It doesn't come from, it doesn't come welling up from inside of me. It comes from hearing. I've heard a word, right? Uh, Abram heard the voice of God and, and followed. Um, the objectivity of the good, the, the great Iris Murdoch, the Irish philosopher, is so good on that. She was a Platonist and uh, brought Plato in some ways up to date for the 20th century. But one of her essays, she talks about when someone's depressed and they're, and they're just they're full of anxiety and they're worried. She said, open the window. And her, her example is, is, I think it's a kestrel. It's a type of bird. It's a, like a type of falcon, I think. I didn't even recognize. But she said, open the window and you see the kestrel. You see the bird, this gorgeous, beautiful bird. And you just start looking at it. And she said, within like a minute, all of your anxieties fall away. And all of your preoccupation falls away. And your depression falls away. And she said, before you know it, you're all kestrel. And her point was, you're so absorbed in the objective goodness of this thing. 
It's begun to rearrange you and remake you. Um, that's the way it is with the good in the Platonic tradition. And a lot of our great people are Platonists in that sense. Um, the recognition, I've called them values, following uh, von Hildebrand, the same idea. These goods, these basic goods. And they will lead you to God if you let them. But if we keep preoccupying ourselves with ourselves, we're not going to get anywhere. We're going to get stuck. Let's shift now to a couple of polls, a couple of surveys dealing with the question of meaning that have recently come out, kind of very timely in light of your Jordan Peterson discussion. The first one came from the LifeWay Research Group. And a lot of the stuff they discovered was stuff we would probably expect, that people sink meaning in God and relationships and family and things like that. But here's one interesting thing I found in the poll. LifeWay discovered that four out of every five Americans, 81%, believe that, quote, there is an ultimate purpose and plan for every person's life. 81% hmm. of people believe there's an ultimate purpose and plan for every person's life. Now, to me, that was surprising in light of the statistics we've covered in the past about how much religion is dwindling yeah. in the culture. I, I find it interesting that so many people believe an ultimate plan, but not a planner or an arranger, an right. agent of, of this plan. How, how do you But you can't that? have it both ways, right? You can't have it. Because if you say, well, I'm making up my own plan. Oh, that's one thing. But they're not talking about that. They're saying there's something, as it were, out there. There's something already there that's that's the purpose of my life. It's like Lewis's thing, right, about uh, everyone finds the same letter in their mailbox, namely like the Tao, right, the sense of moral rectitude and moral responsibility, no matter what the culture is. And he said, is, isn't it odd that every single person in the world finds the same letter in their mailbox? Is it likely that the wind just happened to blow the same letter into every single mailbox in the world? Well, no, it's, it's completely impossible. And so the, this moral law within us, where does that come from? It's like the intelligibility of nature. Where does that come from? That the, the, the world is, is legible so that scientists can do their work. Why are we morally legible that we can we can, uh, or the world is morally legible and we can uh, adjust ourselves to it. Um, we're not coming up with the plan. We discover it out there, so to speak. Well, if that's true, then there has to be something like a planner or someone that provides the purpose. Now I'll go back to Aquinas. So much of his anthropology is predicated upon this idea of final causality, purpose, purpose. How come I do what I do? So this morning, I woke up, and I got out of bed, and I brushed my teeth, and I said my prayers, and I put my uh, uh, suit on, and I came in here. So I, I was operating in a purposive way, right? I'm doing all kinds of things to attain certain goods and values. But why am I ultimately doing all of it? <laughs> so I get out of bed, brush my teeth, get dressed, come in here, do this, do that. Why ultimately am I doing it? There's got to be some finally supreme and unsurpassable good that I'm at least inchoately seeking. So now, look, I'm a bishop of the church, so I'm, I'm kind of aware God is the supreme good. But I mean someone who's a total non-believer. Nevertheless, nevertheless, there is some first cause of the will. There has to be. There's some supreme good that you are at least implicitly seeking. That's the good that will give meaning to your life if you fully surrender to its purposes for you, you know? Now, that's a biblical view of life. And uh, that people still kind of acknowledge it, at least implicitly, that's not bad. That means there's still something of the biblical uh, imagination at work. A second recent poll came from the Pew Research Center. This one was completed earlier this year. They asked 19,000 adults about the question of meaning all across the world. And what was uh, perhaps unsurprising is that in every single country without variation, the top source of meaning was family. Family. Why do you, why do you think family is so closely tied to meaning? Because it's a, it's a great good. So do my little, um, I call it the Russian doll analysis. You know, the little Russian dolls that nest in each other. So I, I, let's say for now, a typical person, uh, I woke up, I brushed my teeth, I, I got dressed. I got in the car, I went to work, 
Well, how come? Well, because I want to make money. Well, why do you want money? Because I want to support my family. Well, why do you want to support your family? Because my family is a great good, and their flourishing is important to me. See, you've reached there. I've got eight Russian dolls, right, that I've, I've situated a very particular act of the will, like getting out of bed in the morning, and I've come by eight steps to a really basic fundamental value, that my family, is it, their flourishing is a great good. Terrific. You found one. You found one of the most basic goods that there are. Now, read the Bible. Is family the ultimate good? Mm-mm. Mm-mm. And the Bible says it in many ways, doesn't it? Like, Abraham, you know your son Isaac, whom you love? I want you to sacrifice him to me. God being cruel. No, no, that's the wrong way to read it, as we've said many times. It's the Bible's way of signaling there's a higher value than even the value of family. Or let's say someone else is motivated because they love their country. Terrific. You found a great value. You're a patriot. Loving your country is a good thing because the, the country is a high value. Highest value? Mm-mm. No, no, no. Because if God is calling you to something that, that goes against the desire of your, of your country, you got to follow God, right? So my point there is those polls represent something very real. People find real values, objective goods in the world. But our job is now to lead them to the summum bonum that's beyond even these great values they discover. Let's close with this final question. I know we likely have listeners uh, to this show that are struggling with this in their life right now. They're they're struggling to find meaning or purpose in their life. Um, Or maybe it's the son or a daughter of one of our listeners or a friend, a loved one who's drifting in nihilism and lost without purpose. As a pastor now, what, what do you say to someone in this situation, someone who comes to you and says, I don't have any meaning and I don't think my life is worth living? You know what I do? I, I get that question a lot. Uh, my user response is to say something like, perform today the simplest act of love. Will the good of, of another. And I'll leave it up to the, I don't know the person's life well enough to know what that would be, but will the good of another. Because that's one of the most important steps out of the self-preoccupation that's making you so unhappy. And it's ordering you toward a value. You've identified someone as a great value, and now you want to serve that person by an act of love. That's a marvelous way to break out of the, of the prison of the self. Another one would be along those Iris Murdoch lines is find something beautiful, something good, like, like that. Maybe it is. It's a, it's a bird you see out, out the window. Look at it. L- look at it. Just spend some time. Study it. Analyze it. I think of that line, you'd like this as a philosopher. It was um, Jacques Maritain said, there's, there's more reality in a seed between my teeth than in all of Hegelian idealism. <laughs> what he meant there was a seed between my teeth. It's real. It's real. It's the simplest, stupidest thing, but it, by God, it's real. And, and it's good in, to that degree because being and good are convertible terms. It's good. There's more reality in a little bug crawling on the ground. Look, look at it. Study it. it. It gets you out of yourself, you know? So that's my advice is perform an act of love or look out the window or on the ground or even between your teeth to find something that's just real and lose yourself in that. That's an important first step. Well, it's time now for our listener question. If you have a question that you'd like to ask Bishop Barron, visit the website askbishopbarron.com. You can record your question there on any device. Today we're hearing from Jake. He lives in the Philippines. Hmm. He's asking about uh, your original discussion with Jordan Peterson, not this Four Horsemen of Meaning one, but a a previous one where the two of you were discussing evil and good. Uh, Here's his question. Hi, Bishop Barron. I'm Jake from the Philippines. I watched an episode of Jordan Peterson's podcast where you and him had a disagreement on what motivated people to commit great evils. You said that even the most evil action is ultimately motivated by the desire for something good. Jordan Peterson disagreed and said that there are people who commit evil just for the sake of evil. 
Can you explain further your argument? Can it be reconciled with Jordan Peterson's view? Thank you, Bishop. Yeah, good. Thank you for that. Um, I, I'm sure those who know a little Aquinas will know that I was operating simply out of a Thomas Aquinas perspective. Uh, the great Aquinas says that, that, that every act of the will is seeking at least the apparent good. And it's just the way the will is structured, right? The, the good is what's desirable. The will seeks the good. That's its nature. Now, objectively speaking, can a wicked person be seeking a wicked end? Yeah, it happens all the time. And so that's why I, I don't deny for a second that there really are wicked people who are seeking very bad, objectively bad things. But at least to them, it was apparently good or else they wouldn't have willed it. You, you can't will something unless there's something at least apparently good in it. Adolf Hitler was willing what appeared good to him in, under some aspect. A person who commits suicide is willing to him the apparent good of his non-existence, right? So in, in a way, it's, it, to me, it's not really a controversial idea. It's just sort of a commonsensical, more logical observation that the way the will is structured, it's always seeking at least something that it thinks is good. But can it be mistaken? Of course. And can wicked people choose wicked things? Yeah, absolutely. That's what makes them wicked. But here's the, the I think, lovely side of that idea, is that even there, Hitler, the, the, the worst people, is there something of God still there? Yes, because God created the will to seek the good. And even it's being done perversely, it's being done with, with deep you know, confusion and inadequacy, Still, there's something of God in it. There's something of, of that trace of divinity in the very way the will is structured. So I guess there I'd say, okay, I, I'd be willing to see at least a glimmer of hope, even in the most you know, desperate moral situation. Well, thanks for that question, Jake. And thanks to all of you for listening to this episode. One more reminder to pick up your copy of the newest issue of our Evangelization and Culture Journal, sponsored by the Word on Fire Institute. This journal is on the topic of freedom. Lots of great articles and interviews, artwork, and a whole lot more. You can get it at wordonfire.institute. When you join the Institute, you get a free copy of this journal, along with all future journals and uh, access to all the great courses inside the Institute Library. Again, the website's wordonfire.institute. Well, thanks so much, and we'll see you next time on the Word on Fire show. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, I invite you to share it and to subscribe to my YouTube channel.